Next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Mehdi Shishabur uh, from University Hospitals of Cleveland. He's going to talk about phoenix atherectomy, why, when, and how. Thank you very much, uh, Suhil, and great presentations. And I agree that with the majority of these uh, devices, uh, you want to go slow. You want to protect yourself uh, from embolization, depending on what lesion you're treating. And you want to be selective, meaning that use the patient's characteristics and the lesion characteristics to decide which device fits best. Um, with that, I'm going to talk about the new kit on the block, uh, the Phoenix atherectomy system. Uh, this is a newer device, does not have uh, a lot of the data that we have seen with some of the other devices. Uh, it was uh, developed by Atromat and uh, acquired by Volcano in 2014, and now obviously is under Philip. Uh, the design of the device is uh, also front cutting, as uh, was mentioned by Dr. Shamas with uh, Jetstream. Uh, it has a housing for capturing of the debris and the plaque uh, that uh, the front cutting blade uh, captures. And the blade basically works under the premise of the Archimedes screw principle, basically screwing the debris into the uh, capture housing and then removing it from the vessel wall. Uh, the debulking is uh, performed by the Archimedes principle, so there's no suctioning uh, with this technology. It comes in with three sizes, and I've given you the sheet sizes there. Uh, the bigger, the, the deflectable uh, device is the 2.4, uh, but it's 7 uh, French, but uh, they do have the 2.2, which is 6 French, and the 1.8, uh, which is 5 French. So typically for the distal vessels, I would say mid to distal uh, tibials, is typically 1.8. For the popliteal and the proximal tibials, I would say 2.2. Uh, and then for the SFA, you can go either 2.2, 2.4, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, the system, uh, the components of the system, he has a, obviously a atherectomy catheter, the three devices that we discussed. He has a battery-powered handle that comes with a catheter and a, glide, uh, and a guide wire uh, clip, as I've shown you here in this picture. The wire comes out of the device like this and then goes back into this clip so that the wire does not wrap around the device. And it uh, collects the debris into a bag, although I never use the bag, to be honest with you. Uh, it does not require any capital equipment. This is it. Uh, this, uh, the catheter, and uh, basically uh, all you need is the wire. The wire for this uh, technology, we typically use the wiper wire. The company also has a wire, but I tend to use the wiper wire. And if you need to use the embolic protection device, obviously you can use a wiper, the step-up wiper, the 014017. Now, uh, my colleagues have already done this. We are calling this technology hybrid. They just... Uh, because of the way it works in regards to uh, debulking and also removing. Uh, but uh, basically what we're trying to say is that this uh, front cutting, it does remove plaque. It, it can be directional, not all the three catheters. I will show you uh, what I'm talking about. And uh, it's single insertion, meaning that you don't need to remove the device to clean the device. So once you put it, it's a one-time deal. And uh, there is no need for capital equipment. I'm not going to discuss the other ones, which we have heard in detail. So the deflection part, it comes with a 2.4. So this is a, a patient of mine with severe, heavily calcified osteal SFA. You can see here the calcification. So this is a 2.4 deflectable, so we can use it and ma manipulate it by uh, clocking and countering to get it where we want it to go. This is post the uh, Phoenix atherectomy, and now we can go in there and uh, do DCB, and we can get this kind of a result in a heavily calcified lesion uh, like uh, the one I've shown you. For more lower lesions, uh, the catheters are not deflectable, the 2.2 and the 1.8. So for something like this, we would probably be using a 2.2. You can see there is significant below knee disease. And here we can perform atherectomy. So this is after atherectomy and angioplasty. And we can get this kind of result after uh, this kind of technology, using this kind of technology, which does well in calcium. And again, the issue of calcium is big. So there are a lot of the technologies that claim they do well in calcium. Uh, this is a rock, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, this is, again, uh, using the 2.2 device. So it all comes down to what are you trying to achieve. You know, in this situation, do I want to go crazy and remove 70%, 80% of the plaque, or do I want to just modify the plaque and uh, see how it responds to my balloon? So in this situation, we use the 2.2, and we are able to create a channel through this rock, and uh, we then perform a drug-coated balloon angioplasty, and we are able to get away with just drug-coated balloon angioplasty. So I mixed it up a little bit. I am going to show you the data now. 
you know, uh, so just, uh, just to mix it up uh, so you don't go to sleep. Um, so it's a lot of data. So uh, this, as I said, we don't have as extensive data as, uh, for example, Dr. Ronback presented with the, the other devices. Uh, this device uh, was evaluated, obviously, in the IDEs. Uh, study uh, to get his indication. Uh, it was uh, 123 lesions in 105 patients. The primary endpoints were acute debulking uh, with less than 50% residual stenosis and obviously 30-day safety major adverse events. And all three devices were used. Uh, you can see that of the 123 uh, patients, 33% of the patients were CLI patients. So they weren't all like Rutherford 2 and 3. There were some complicated patients in this uh, group of uh, patients and, and significant portion were Rutherford 4 and 5. So looking at uh, some of the endpoints uh, and the requirements uh, for uh, stenting, uh, there was only one patient that required stenting uh, in the ease, uh, IDE study, and uh, one person, patient required pretreatment to be able to get the device through. So again, looking at the outcome of this study, there was a 95.1% uh, technical success, uh, and from a safety standpoint, there were 5.7% uh, complication rate, which I have listed there, including uh, three cases of unplanned toe amputation, something to look at carefully. And I think because of this uh, the data, the company then modified the device uh, to, to taper the tip, uh, given the, uh, that is front cutting, and with that decided to move on and conduct a much bigger registry using the second generation technology. Now, before I go over this, I wanted to just uh, discuss briefly the technical aspect of this device. Similar to the other devices, you want to go very slow. Uh, you want to move forward about two to three millimeters and then go back a millimeter. Two to three millimeters, go back. If the patient has pain, you don't go forward. You go back. So pain is a bad sign because sometimes uh, because of the Archimedes principle, it can grab tissue. So you have to really pull back and go again. As long as you do that, you won't have any complications. But if a patient has pain and you keep pushing, it will perforate. So regarding the more global registry that we have now been fortunate to be a part of this with uh, Dr. Montero Baker, and uh, this is a study that's a uh, little bit more extensive uh, relative to the EASE study. Uh, we are capturing ABI, Wi-Fi uh, classification, TLR, and TVR, and again, looking at the uh, target limb amputation and some of the safety endpoints related to Rutherford class and uh, tissue loss. So uh, we have an interim analysis that I uh, was able to share with you today. Uh, there were 250 patients of Rutherford 2 through 6. Of those 142 have a CLI, which are Rutherford 4 to 6. So looking at the data, again, similar to the other studies, these are uh, patients with significant uh, prevalence of diabetes, as shown here. And uh, you can see that a significant portion of the patients uh, have below knee disease. So if you look at the CLI, 75% of the patients are below knee disease, which is consistent what we would expect. Rotafer class 2 uh, and 3, uh, significant above uh, knee disease. And looking at the uh, safety, uh, safety primaries and secondary endpoints, so from the standpoint of effectiveness, 99% success, so they were able to use the atherectomy device successfully, and there was 1.2% adverse events. Uh, TLR rates were low, as you can see here, and limb amputation was also low, given that significant portion of the patients were CLI patients. Now, I'm just going to move a little bit quickly uh, because of time. Um, in regards to the Rutherford classification at 30 days, there was a significant improvement with the Rutherford classification. And you can see there's a theme here, right? I mean, these devices work well for majority of the patients, but you have to just be careful because even if you have one or two embolization or one or two perforation, that's too many. So again, uh, patient selection is important, but you can see there was consistent improvement in the Rutherford classification. And also there was a significant improvement in the Wi-Fi classification. So 90% of the patients went from a high risk a category in the Wi-Fi to a lower risk uh, or very low risk in this situation. And then from the standpoint of the CLI subset, again, there was a 99.2% success rate with a very low TLR rate at 30 days of 0.8% and 6.7% at 12 months. So 93% you know, uh, patency from a TLR standpoint uh, for CLI cohort. And the amputation rate, again, uh, it was 7.6 at 30 days and 12.5 uh, uh, at the 12 months in the CLI cohort. Again, there was a significant improvement in the Rutherford classification as shown here. And there was, a, so in conclusion, uh, I think that similar to the other technologies, it's another tool in our armamentarium. I think there are some advantages of it. It is low profile, especially the six 
and the five French. It does well in calcium, as I've shown you the cases. I think it's easy to use, and it doesn't require any capital equipment. Uh, thank you very much.